I go back and I look at her things and I look at yeah. it on YouTube. I, I'm never looking at it online. So, okay, I'm recording it right now. So we will begin. And hello, everyone. And uh, today we are doing a Cove call with artist Michelle Kessler. And Michelle earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts with a minor in history from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth which was followed by a bachelor in science in management information systems at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. After a successful career in business, she returned to her artist roots and purchased the Young Rembrandt's franchise in Vermont, bringing after-school art enrichment to elementary school aged children. For seven years, she ran the business while following her passion for creating art. Early in Michelle's career, she painted primarily in watercolor and studied Shoto and Itagami in Japan. She later moved to pastels, preferring the medium which enabled bold, opaque colors for expressive portraits. Pastels also provided the texture and raw color blending that she was not able to accomplish using watercolors. After several years, she began experimenting with oils and fell in love with the medium's versatility and the freedom from the constraints of glass as required when framing pastel and watercolor artworks. Today, Michelle lives in Stowe, Vermont, and paints primarily in oils and pastels, heavily influenced by the expressionist painters that came before her. So welcome, Michelle. And uh, today, I guess we'll be hearing about your process and your work and um, maybe getting the rest of us interested in taking up art. So the first thing I have to say about art is everyone can learn to draw. Law drawing is a skill. And, and I just feel like it's a great way of expressing oneself. Um, even though I had left art for a little while, I never actually fully left it because I was still always doing something on the side. I have little notebooks and in every meeting I had little doodles on the side. So I never stopped <laughs> doing creative things. Um, what I found was um, probably like a lot of people is during COVID, you know, I was home, stuck in the house, and just felt very isolated, and I started developing all of this angst. I was doing primarily um, uh, abstract paintings, and I kind of wanted to get back to a little bit more of the portraits, which is what I had done in the past, And but I didn't want to just do portraits. I wanted to do something a little bit different, and when I was in Paris, I absolutely fell in love with the weeping angels and all the uh, cemeteries. So I don't know if you've been to Paris, but if you haven't, do not miss out on those wonderful weeping angels in the cemeteries. Um, I took loads of pictures and it just seemed like a great outlet to be able to express myself and just show the, the frustration and just anxiety a lot of people were having during you know, the, especially the beginning of the COVID when we really didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and the painting behind me was one of the paintings I had done. Um, she's, you know, a weeping angel, obviously in great despair, <laughs> which is about how I was feeling back then. So what I'm gonna do, and um, please bear with me, I'm using my son's um, computer here. I'm actually gonna pull up a screen with um, some of the artwork that I have. Um, and now I forget how to do share screen. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. You should see a share screen button yeah. down at the bottom. Okay. Okay. Um, so am I sharing the screen now? I cannot see. You're not sharing it yet. Okay. Did you open your PowerPoint? Share, oh, I see share. Mm -hmm. Okay, am I sharing now? I guess you are. I don't know what I'm sharing, but you're sharing okay. you're sharing the Zoom screen. There we go. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, so um, this is you know an example of one of the pictures that I took when I was in Paris, and how I visualized this particular weeping angel. Um, she was actually the first one I did, and um, probably one of my favorites. Um, I don't know whether it's just because, you know, she was my first child, but I just, you know, really, really um, enjoyed painting this particular weeping angel. The weeping angel is, um, it's in oil. 
I actually had quite a large process with this one. Um, how this Weeping Angel started is completely different than how it ended up. I originally was doing a much more realistic painting and um, it just kind of evolved and I started playing with colors and this is kind of where I, I ended up. Um, and you'll see as I proceed through these, you'll see a particular theme. Um, and if you're familiar, familiar with expressionist painters, um, I kind of follow along those lines. It's kind of the um, people that have influenced me. Oops. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure, go right ahead. So what, what influences what colors you're gonna use? Like, do they have any special meaning? Did you choose the colors for a particular purpose or were you just kind of playing with them? I think um, that's an interesting question because when I go back and I look through my paintings, what I do find similar colors in the flow. Um, they're just colors I seem to graduate, uh, graduate, um, graduate. I can't gravitate, gravitate <laughs> towards. Um, I just, you know, the the reds, the yellows, um, the teals. They they kind of um, com they partly conflict with each other, um, which I think is nice because it gives the um, painting tension. Um, I, I don't always think in advance of what colors I'm going to use. Um, a lot of times I, I have a image in my head and I just start playing with it. I pretty much use all the paintings that you'll see here. We're all done with a palette knife. Um, I rarely ever use a brush. Wow. So, um, yeah, everything, this entire painting was done with a palette knife. So, um, or palette knives. I've got several different knives that I use different sizes. Um, I like to find um, pieces of the image to pull out, to express emotion. Um, this particular painting, um, you can't really see the, the lower part of where the, you know, the, the breasts are, but it's almost like a um, see-through garment that I created in the painting. I can show that when I'm done with the slideshow. But with this one, with the, the angst and the feeling I wanted to get, was just that if you look at the actual photograph, you'll see the neck, you know, how the neck yes. is really yes. stretched out. I really wanted to emphasize that. And I know when I first started doing it, um, this painting, the neck was actually red. And I, and I kind of over time changed, changed it um, to these colors that are kind of depressing in a way, but emphasizing, you know, that, that, that stress of, you know, not knowing what was going on. Um, this one right here, this was, um, this is uh, Delita. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Um, she is, I believe she was Egyptian. She was um, a really big pop star of like the 50s and 60s and I think into the 70s. But she has a magnificent statue. Um, this is not the picture I took. The picture I took was black and white, um, but I wanted to show the color, the way the color is actually in person. So I went online and pulled out the picture that was in color so you could see it. Um, again, one of the things I wanted to emphasize with this is I wanted to take her beautiful face and turn it into a mask and really, you know, sharpen those edges around the forehead, down to the chin, the, you know, the, um, the jowls, because um, I don't know if you know much about her, but she actually um, died by suicide. And she was just this incredible woman, beautiful voice, so talented. And yet inside there was just something that wasn't, you know, that was pain. And um, obviously, you know, she ended up uh, committing suicide. So I wanted, a, I wanted to create her face to be a mask. Um, so it's, you know, maintain the beauty, but, you know, give the facade that maybe there's something else behind there. Um, this is a famous um, tombstone. Um, the artist is Bradley. 
And um, it's not, you can't see it in this particular picture. I took tons of pictures of this and I plan to do several different paintings from different angles, but he was an artist and there's actually a paint, um, a palette on this tombstone. But I liked this angle again, you know, keeping with that theme of just, you know, angst of, you know, it's a, the main word I can think of for this whole series. And then again, it all ties back to kind of where I was in the beginning of when everything was shut down. And that's when I did these paintings was during that time. And, um, you know, just, and just for your, you know, the other thing too is at this time when we were going through all of this, um, last April, my son's best friend and family friends, their son had also died by suicide. So we were, we were going through a lot of, um, pain and emotion and I mean, really this is what came out came out of me at that time and that's part of why these paintings look the way they look um this is a picture I took this is from the Louvre um I took this picture I knew when I saw this I immediately wanted to someday paint it this is a very large painting um and what I was looking for here is just you know a big storm and I wanted to reflect the stone, but make it soft and then make the wings very soft. So that there's, even though the wings and the, um, the goddess are the same image and they're the same material, the marble from the Louvre, I wanted the wings to have a very softer, different feel than the body. So, um, and this is this is actually I I really like this painting. Um, I love this painting. This is gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, I I still have to touch it up a little bit. There are some pieces I don't like, but you know I'm never fully happy. But um, I just I just really enjoyed painting this. And I will tell you my process. Every painting I go through, I start the painting very excited, and I get to a point where I hate it. Like I get right. <laughs> canvases where I've just painted over. And then, and so I've yeah. learned to get through the hate. And this painting had a severe hate stage where I was tempted to just paint over the whole canvas. And I'm glad I kept going because I, uh, I am pretty happy with it. So now we're getting to pastels and you're gonna see happier paintings because these paintings were done before you know COVID, before, um, you know, we were having all these, you know, uncertainties going on. And this is where I was before. I, I by the way, I've done a lot more um, Weeping Angels and they're on my website. I just wanted to, um, you know, show a few examples. Um, but this is an example of a pa typical pastel painting. Um, you can see my brush strokes with the pastels are still very expressionistic, the same way I use with a palette knife. I um, integrate a lot of different colors. I try to use um, colors that you wouldn't necessarily um, anticipate in a particular portrait. Um, this is a portrait of a ballet dancer from San Francisco. And that was one of the outfits that she had had. So I, I just fell in love with it. And this is, um, my rendition of that particular pose that she had had. I tend to use a lot of purples, um, a lot of greens. Um, they're the type of colors that if you are not careful, you will end up with what artists call mud. You know, you never wanna mix um, complementary colors because if you do, you, you can actually end up with just a bunch of brown colors. So it's, um, it's a process that you have to learn so that you know how to mix those particular colors um, appropriately so they don't blend in together. They maintain their own um, uh, pigment. Uh, this is a self-portrait that I did. And again, you know, similar, it's just, this is kind of the style that I like to, I like to do a lot of different colors, um, greens, purples, um, and this, this was an older one. This is from like 2005, just, you know, show you over time. This is um, a pastel of my sister actually. And um, 
this was a little bit different for me. It was, you know, I, it was a little more realistic, but at the same time, you know, the same expressionist strokes and colors on the skin. The next slide, what I'd like to show is my process. And I'm just gonna talk about the process a little bit. And this is, I think, important because the bottom line, everyone can learn to draw. Um, and, you know, if you go into a museum and look at some of those Picasso pa paintings, even though he was a fabulous drawer and did amazing realistic artwork early on in his career, we can all do a Picasso um, cubist painting if we have to. So it's always, it's fun to experiment and drawing again is a skill. And if you look at the first image on the left, the drawing, what you're going to do is if you look carefully, you will see lines, lots of lines that, going, that go across the page, um, vertical lines, and there are even some horizontal lines. So when I look at an image, um, and let me just go back, this was, this was the, you can see the image on the left here. Um, so if I were to look at that image, and keep in mind, this is a, this is a pretty big drawing. This is um, probably, I believe the drawing is like 40 by 30. So it's, it's, it's a good size drawing, it's not small. Um, I like to um, use guidelines as I call them to establish where my composition is gonna go. So by using these guidelines, I can get a really you know, good idea of how I'm gonna actually blow up this image. And you can, and, I mean, you can't really see it, but um, there are lots of different lines in here and those are mistakes. So yeah, I make lots of mistakes. Um, you can see I have lots of lines here trying to figure out uh, where is that, that hat gonna go off the top. Um, I did not like the hat that was in this, you know, she's wearing kind of a cowboy hat. I did not like that hat. I wanted to do something a little bit different. So I did change the hat. Um, so, you know, there you have artist expression. You can change things up. You don't have to do exactly what's in the image. And I did extend- oh, that, um, Can I ask you of like, what makes you choose a picture like this? Is it just like the contrast of the scarf and the, like, what do you look for in a photo? For me, I look for something that is um, going to catch my eye and, and just um, make me excited. This, it was the scarf. This could have been anyone. Right. It was just the scarf. I just loved when I went and I looked at this photograph. The first thing I knew is I wanted to paint the scarf. Um, the textures, the lines. I mean, I just visualized this. Um, and I just got really excited about it. And I, I feel just, like you gave it even more character in your painting. <laughs> well, I, well, I made it different. I mean, see how the, you know, this hat, the way the hat is set up. Yeah. Um, what I do is because I changed the hat, I also changed how the scarf flowed. So yeah. you can see this whole section right here, I added. Right. And um, so, and by doing that also meant adding like a little bit more detail and, and you may not see it, but um, the scarf, when you're looking at it, you know, you can see the shadows, you can, you know, see the red and the white, but there is actually a lot of yellow in this scarf. Um, there are really? yellows, there are blues, um, there, there's a lot of purple. One of the things I do not use is I never use um, the color black. Notice the eyeglasses look black. Mm -hmm. I did not use black to create those eyeglasses. I used, it's a very, very deep blue and um, purple blends. And I blended the pastel. Mm -hmm. This is not black. That's all um, purple and blue. I'm not, I've never been a big fan of using black. So this, these are all colors that are been blended to create these um, shades and tones. So for me, it's just, it's something that um, has to attract me. Like for instance, with this, it was the feathers and also the eyes. Um, I, 
you can stand anywhere in the room and she is staring at you. And, um, and that's how I painted that portrait. And this one is the same way. You can stand anywhere in the room and she's got a dazed stare and it's, it's right at you. Um, this one is in glasses, so yeah, there's no stare. <laughs> you can just pretend she's staring at you. Um, so this is basically an, uh, um, an image of how I would sketch out what I'm going to draw. And as you can see, I decided I didn't like the hat, so I redid the whole scarf here, and I redid it here, and I and this is where I came up with the idea of doing kind of a different kind of a Russian hat. Once I have the sketches, the sketches done, the next process, I then go in color. I basically call it color blocking. Um, there are times where I'll go in and I'll put the highlights, like the yellows. You can see the yellows in here, the peaches, kind of get in and some of the shadows, figuring out where those are gonna go. And then in this case, um, I was just love the star, the scarf. So I, um, I threw in some lines and I believe I did this in purple um, to emphasize where I was gonna have those um, folds going. And then I started blocking in the red just to make sure that it was gonna work. And I didn't have to tear up this lovely piece of paper. All my, um, all my pastels are done on what's called sandpaper, not the sandpaper you buy in the you know, hardware store, but basically feels the exact same. It's an artist grade paper and it's, it's very rough. It, it does feel like sandpaper, but it, it's a lovely um, surface to capture and hold pastels and hold the pigment. This right here, so this would be the first step. Then the next step, um, I don't always fill in the background, but sometimes I like to get um, an idea of how that color is gonna work with the skin tone. And I wanted to make sure that um, they were gonna complement each other. So I did do that. But as you can see here, um, starting to block in some of the colors, starting to get some of the details. Um, and then I'm just continuing going on with the details. Um, playing with some of the shadow techniques. I did start down on the bottom for shadow techniques because this is such a large piece of the painting. I wanted to make sure I, I was comfortable with it before moving on. And then I slowly um, got to this and that, that was my final version. So that is um, what I have um, presented here. What I do want to go back now that I've shown kind of um, what I've done here, if you look at, and from an artist's perspective, if you look at the technique here, and if we were to go all the way back to this first one, sorry, you, you can kind of see the technique is the same. It's just a different material. Um, hopefully you can see the, the roughness. Yeah, definitely. Palette versus um, the roughness of the pastel. So even though I'm using different mediums, um, I kind of stay the same. I sort of follow the same process. Um, a lot of people that do pastels, you know, they'll, they'll do blending and, um, uh, you know, smoothing out the pastels. And that's what a lot of people are used to. I personally prefer the roughness. I like to see the strokes. Oops. Um, why isn't that going? Okay. I'll just go quicker here. So when I first started out, um, you know, in art school, I was primarily doing charcoals and I was also doing um, figure drawing. That was kind of what I focused on in fine arts. And then when I graduated, I started doing more watercolor paintings and getting away from that, you know, the two tones of the black and the whites and the grays. Um, and my artwork was much more realistic. I don't know if, um, hopefully you can see the difference. This is a much more realistic um, painting, even though the, the background's kind of impressionistic, the um, actual figures are much more realistic 
can probably match the photograph a lot better than my works that I do today. But um, with watercolors, as much as I love the medium, the, the issue with the watercolors is that it's difficult to get the kind of blending that you can get with pastels and oils. And the other um, issue is with um, pastels and oil, I'm sorry, pastels and watercolors, you have to frame behind glass. Um, there are some materials that you can use with both watercolor and pastels that apparently it's, it's a spray that would allow you to frame without a glass. I, I've never used those. Um, and I also, because you're actually painting on paper or um, on like sandpaper, or even if it's a 300 pound uh, weight paint, with, I mean paper, which is what I use for watercolors, it, it's still, I, I feel like it needs to be behind glass to be protected. So that's what I do love about the oils is the canvas is that you do not have to frame um, in glass. This was actually a picture that my brother had taken and that's his daughter when she was little. And we were on our way to the Nutcracker in Boston, which is where I used to live. Today, I also do a lot of um, abstracts and this would be a typical abstract. Um, when I um, do abstract painting, I'm looking to create a feeling. Um, and if, I would recommend this to anyone who's interested in doing art. And if you want to get into abstract painting, um, pick some colors and do some tonal paintings. Um, this particular painting um, was about, I want to say four different layers. I started off with the base layer um, of oil, deciding exactly what colors I had planned to use. And then I let it dry for about four months. And then I put the texture on, which again was more oil paint. And um, if you look, you know, you can kind of see the texture. That's um, very, very thick applied oil paint. And then I waited for it to dry again, uh, I don't know, it, at least another couple of months for it to dry. And then I um, painted, I started with the color scheme that I wanted, and then I slowly um, built it up. So this painting took a long time to do just because it was different layers and oil does take a, time, a little bit longer to dry and set. When you're doing oils, um, there's a technique, it, it's called fat over lean. That's a really important concept when you're doing oil paints. If you're ever um, buy an oil painting, and we have some friends that had done this, they asked me if I knew why their painting cracked. And I said, well, it's because your artist didn't follow the basic rule of fat over lean. And what that means is when you paint with oils, you have to mix the oil with a medium. And the medium is actually really kind of important. And I'm going to um, show you what those are. And that's, that'll be the next part of this presentation if I can figure out how to stop sharing this. Ah, okay. So let me show you mediums, what fun. Sorry, I'm not wearing shoes. <laughs> All right, so oil painting. Um, one of the important things when you're doing oil paints, and this is critical, um, you can use oils straight out of the tube. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. It gets really expensive to do that because oil paints are expensive. Um, so you do want to thin out the oil paints as you're painting. Um, and I use a product um, called Gawkland. Yes, lovely stuff. Um, and Gamblin is a great brand because Gamblin is, um, I don't know how they've done it. Their stuff is still very toxic. Don't drink it, don't eat it. But it um, doesn't smell. You know, most people, when they think of oils, they think of like turpentine as kind of like the medium to, you know, um, make the paint thinner so that, you know, it's easier to paint with. Um, 
but um, turpentine is not only toxic, but it smells really bad. So these are great products that I use. Um, this is a great medium. It helps the paint dry faster, but at the same time, um, maintains um, a really nice texture as you mix it in with the oil. Um, this is another, this is um, Gemsol. This is another product. This is kind of, I use this to replace turpentine. It can be used as um, a paint thinner medium. Um, and it can also be used to clean your paintbrushes. Obviously oil and water don't mix. And that is exactly why you cannot wash your paintbrushes with water. So you have to use this um, or turpentine if you um, like the smell of that, which I don't know, I don't think I like the smell of that. Um, the other thing too, you'll find a lot of um, artists, they will um, create their own base medium. And that's what I use. When, so when I was talking about that abstract painting being multiple layers, the first layer was the paint was mixed with this, my base medium. And what I do is I mix um, a little bit of linseed oil, a little bit of gemsol, and of course, a little bit of this. Um, and I've eventually, I think, I think it's one, one, two is how I mix it. But every artist has their own little formula and every artist will tell you their formula is the best, but really it's what works for you. It's not, no one's formula is the best. The best is whatever you deem works for you. Um, so I start all my oil paintings. I always put a primer on. Um, some canvases will come with primer. I prime them anyway. Um, I would love to do an oil demonstration, but you know, I would do the primer and then I'd say, all right, come back in two months. And then I would do the next layer. Oh, okay, everybody come back in three months. It, it's a long process. Um, it's not really something that can be really done in an hour demonstration. Happy to show anyone if you want to call me. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what I do with the oils. Um, and when I'm talking fat over lean, um, this is where I was getting at. So if you don't want your artwork to crack a year after you've painted it, I mean, I spent a lot of time painting this lovely lady. And if she starts cracking, I'm going to be pretty upset. Um, so it's really important to actually mix and have a fat base, which is mixing more oil, like linseed oil into your pigment of your paint versus um, a medium that doesn't have as much oil. So for an example, this, my base has very little oil in it. So it will dry faster and it will hold onto the canvas. Because what happens is, as you do layers with oil, so if you have a couple of layers, oil takes a long time to dry. So if your first layer has a lot of oil in it, it's going to take a while to dry. And then if you put a layer with less oil, well, this is going to dry before that bottom layer. And if this layer dries before the bottom layer, what's going to happen to this layer as this one dries? It's going to crack. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why a lot of artists are afraid of oils, um, because one, it takes a long time to dry. It takes a long time to cure and set, but at the same time, that's what makes it so beautiful because when you're painting oils and say for, like, I think when I had talked earlier, this neck was originally like almost all red. I came back and looked at it the next day and I was just like, oh my goodness, what did I do? She looks like she's like blood coming. It was just frightening. So what did I do? I took my palette knife and I just went and I scraped it all off and I repainted it with something that, you know, I thought was a little more appropriate and was going to convey the message that I was trying to convey. If this is my watercolor, I would have taken that painting and I would have just tore it up because when you paint on watercolors, the minute the paint touches that paper, you own it. You own it. It's not going anywhere. The paper just absorbed your water and your pigment. And yeah, that's it. 
and that's, I just love oils because I just, I make a lot of mistakes. So I can just shh, take them off. Um, of course, if I wait a month, you know, I can then just paint over it. Like I never had it there. Um, this, by the way, this canvas has another painting underneath it. I wasn't happy with it. I didn't like it. It was a landscape and it was awful, terrible. Um, so yeah, that landscape is now officially gone. And someday, maybe in a hundred years when they decide that my work is like extra special and they wanna examine my paintings like they do with Picasso, they'll look and they'll say, hey, there's a painting under here. And they'll say the same thing. That was really awful. It's good that she painted over it. So that's one of the great things about oils. Um, it, there is a lot of versatility with it. Um, pastels, you put that pastel down, you own it. Watercolors the same way. Those are extremely difficult mediums. Um, then there's a the question of the difference between acrylics versus oils. Acrylics are great, they dry faster and they're water-based. And so it gives people a lot more versatility. But I, um, I find the, the texture and the movement of oils um, more flexible. I, um, it, it just, it's, I don't know, it's like the difference between um, having like real butter and margarine. Um, margarine, you know, it's okay if you've got nothing else, but I'll tell you a nice salted butter on bread, come on. <laughs> <laughs> how, how can you pass that up? Um, so anyway, I was hoping to leave a few minutes. How am I doing for time? Oh, good. Uh, for questions. I know there's just Luke and Marion here, and Ruby and Mara. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Oh, and then, oh, there, you can see her lovely breasts right there. She's got um, kind of like a sheer um, design. So as you can see, I really did change when I, even though the, um, the image is very different here than the image at the cemetery, I did want to bring these to life. Um, I wanted, I didn't want them just to, you know, be weeping anxiety angels. I wanted them to, to feel real. Uh, so anyway. Well, I have a question. I was wondering before when you said that um, during COVID and some of the dark things that were going on, you kind of were, you were focused on doing weeping angels and showing sort of the despair of the moment. Is that always the case when you're painting? Do you generally um, let what you're experiencing in your life or your emotions kind of guide you to your next muse, so to speak? I think so, yeah. I am. Um... I definitely, I internalize things. Um, and what's interesting, I find when I am done with a painting, I don't really remember everything I did to paint it. It just kind of, this is what happened. I mean, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this, when I was um, painting her, I do remember, and that's the reason why I'm so proud of the, the breast area. <laughs> I know it's an odd thing to say, but you know, artists. Um, this, I almost threw out this painting because I didn't like the way this was coming out. I wanted a translucent drapery and it just wasn't working. And then finally, I don't know, I woke up the next day. I just went to the painting. I did it. And then I woke up the next day. I was like, oh, I like that. And I honestly don't even remember. I usually, you know, put on music. I like to listen to cake. So I usually, you know, have cake in the background. And um, yeah, and I just kind of, it, it becomes almost a meditative state. Michelle, <laughs> I love her. I, I love you too, but I love her. She's so... I don't know. She has so much emotion. Um, I am curious because I'm, I'm looking at several of your paintings and to me, they draw up, um, you know, memories of seeing other paintings because that's what I have for a frame of reference, not being an artist myself. 
Um, do you, I, I'm sure you have favorite artists. Do you have, but are there like specific pieces that, um, that you're drawn to by other artists or do you feel is art so much more internal for you that, that you, you don't, I, I don't know what I'm trying to get at. No, but. I understand. Um, you know, I, I think I have been influenced. I love the folds. Um, they, that, I think that art movement, and a lot of people think of Matisse when they think of that movement, but there are actually a lot of other artists that were painting in that style. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, the artists that were painting back then, um, and a lot of artists were actually German and they had to leave Germany because um, obviously expressionism and the Hitler movement, you know, they weren't, they didn't mix. Um, it was just not a good thing for them. Um, and especially since some of those artists, you know, were gay and that was not a good mix with the Hitler movement either. So um, they did have to leave and a lot of them went to Austria and um, they, you know, continued the movement there of expressionism. And I've always been drawn to those particular artists. And their paintings, I think, really reflected what was going on at that time, you know, what they were going through, you know, the losing, you know, their homes and having to give up everything um, just because of who they were and, you know, what they painted. So, I am definitely drawn to those artists, and I think those artists um, greatly influenced what I do today. But I do feel like there's a part that's also very internal. And um, this painting, um, this is just one, but a lot of my paintings I feel really do reflect. And when I go back and look at paintings from you know that I did, you know, back in the '90s versus today, they're very different. Um, and I, it's just a journey, and I don't know whether because I'm getting older, but they're getting more, you know, kind of scary. Um, <laughs> but um, but it, it, I do feel, honestly, as I get older, I feel like I'm more confident to express who I am. Just uh, you know, not speaking about art, but I would say. It, just looking at myself 10 years ago and myself today, yes, I'm more confident expressing who I am. And I, I hope that, and I'm encouraged to see that that's an ongoing trend for many people, but yeah. I mean, I just, um, I think that um, I always encourage people to do art. Um, I had um, my book club, I had them all over and I did an art class with my book club. We had some wine and pastels and paper and, you know, and I will admit some of them did a really good job. Some of them could use some lessons, but one of the things that everybody walked away with was a sense of like, wow, you know, I did that, you know? Um, oh. One of the women, her painting looked like it could have been done by a two-year-old, but you know what? She had a great time. You know, and when she got done, she couldn't believe she said, I really did this. I'm like, yes, you did. <laughs> um, and I got Michelle, what do you think is the best way to get started if you don't necessarily have a lot of native talent? Like, what do you think is the best medium to start with so that you don't get discouraged or find it too frustrating? I think um, for starting out, I would. Um, start off with a piece of paper and a pencil and go on YouTube. There are so many tutorials on there on how to draw. Um, that's what I, that's how I would do it. And you can do it in the privacy of your own house. No one ever needs to see what you drew. And then as you build up your skills, you say, you, know, you don't have to tell them you did like 500 drawings before that. You just show them, oh, look at this. Um, what about, uh, what about learning how to do art with Cove? Yeah, <laughs> do art with Cove. <laughs> Mara, just come to the office 
and we'll have a couple of private lessons together. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the things I don't recommend, I know so many people and Ashley, um, the director at my son's school did this as well. She asked me, she said, oh, you know, I really want to start doing some art. Um, I bought some watercolors. I'm really excited. Watercolors are an extremely difficult medium to use. Um, I don't know, unless you've done art, um, I don't know if people realize how difficult watercolors really are. Um, you know, it's, you know, when I talk about mixing um, the oil pigment with, you know, different mediums to get it to the texture that I want it to be in, um, watercolors, it's the same thing working with water. And it's, you know, and of course the ones that pigment hits the paper, the watercolor paper, I mean, that's it. I mean, sometimes you can wipe it off depending on the color, but nine times out of 10, you know, you own it at that point. And it is a very difficult medium to work with. So I wouldn't recommend starting with watercolors. Um, colored pencils is a great way to start. Um, just regular graphite pencils and any art store, you know, you want to make sure you have a nice soft graphite pencil. So, you know, stay away from like, you know, your school number twos. You want to go to like a four or a six. Um, maybe work with charcoals, Conte sticks. That's another option as well. Great way to practice. Um, I like telling people start with, you know, simple black and whites, you know, learn how to do the shading, learn how to, you know, make an apple look three dimensional. And then maybe bring in pastels. Pastels is another great way to get started. There are a lot of inexpensive products out there. I wouldn't, I mean, I'll show you my pastels. I love these. I like to show them off. Um, Oh. All right, so these are my pastels. <laughs> um, this is a Ayu Schmick, their German pastel. Um, and oh yeah, here's my color chart. But I have two layers of these pastels. This is, um, there's another layer underneath. Um, each pastel, the reason why I say, you know, you wanna start off by an inexpensive set, um, each one of these pastels is between, I would say five to $12 per pastel. So, and I believe this entire set was a little over a thousand. So, but it was a gift. <laughs> um, anyway, I've had to replace my standard colors, which are the purples. I always use a lot of purples. But anyway, um, pastels, you can go to like Michael's and just get an inexpensive box of pastels and um, you don't have to spend that much. But as you improve and as you um, develop your skills, you are gonna want to start using better products. The last thing you want is to create your masterpiece and found out, find out you put it on like a piece of cheap paper, you know? Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of like you want to have um, your products for practice, you want to have your products for, um, you know, playing, but at the same time, you also want to have your products as you get better, be higher quality. Do you have any paintings that are just so personal that you love them, but you don't show them to anyone? Um, you know, if I have a painting like that, I'll just destroy it. <laughs> Why is that? Um, I don't know. It's kind of like the landscape that's underneath this painting. Uh, I just didn't like it. Um, sometimes there are paintings that are like that. Um, I do have um, a notebook that has, um, I'm trying to think, I don't, I packed, I've packed up my art room because um, I'm moving to the studio tomorrow. So like a lot of stuff is packed up, sorry. Um, I do have a watercolor painting. Hold on, let me see if I can put this. Um, uh, oh, here's the painting right here. 
Um, I don't know why I feel like it's very personal, but I just do. This is a watercolor painting that I've been working on. I um, haven't gotten it to where I really want it yet. Um, I'm thinking about redoing it, doing a different version of it as a pastel. Um, but I mean, I have a lot more work to do with this. But it's not a, is that a woman with an umbrella or a hat? Or? Um, she's with an umbrella. Um, okay. So when we were in South Korea, we were there for, um, I think we were there for like nine or 10 days. And we were at one of the palaces. Thank and you. This woman started walking and she was in a very traditional um, uh, Korean outfit. And I just saw her there and it just seemed just very lonely to me. Um, so I took a picture of it. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you can see it. This is the actual picture that I took. And it just seemed um, wow. really lonely. I don't know. It just, in this, it just hit me a certain way and um, I wanted to paint it and I did want to do a more realistic painting of it. Um, but going back to it now, I think I would prefer to go back to a more expressionist version of this. So I'll probably end up doing this as an oil painting at some point. Well, if you decide that you want to destroy that one, you can destroy it over to my house. <laughs> okay, I actually um, have, there was a, another painting I did, same thing. A friend of mine, Martha from Boston, I had a painting that I did of these roses. And I was just like, oh, I think I'll try and paint some roses. And I thought it came out horrible. And honestly, it did. It, it was a bad, bad, bad painting. I mean, bad. And, um, but for some reason, she liked it. And I was like, all right, well, here, I handed it to her. And she framed it and it's hanging in her living room. So every time I go there, I personally cringe because I know how bad it is, but she loves it. So hey, art is, you know, in the art, eyes of the beholder. And um, what person, one person loves, another person deems as, you know, good art. It's a necessary the same. And that's what makes art so great. We can all enjoy it. We can all hang our paintings and, so you've got people that love the, um, I don't know, gauche art and my sister-in-law. Uh, who is it? Uh, I don't know, the guy that was selling all those paintings in the mall, the painter of light, um, King K, King Dale or King K, I don't know, whatever his name was. He had, he had all these shops all over the mall selling his artwork and my sister-in-law loves them. And um to me, I don't. So it's that watercolor know. reminds me of uh, John Singer Sargent painting the Fumé de Ambergris that's at the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Mass. I love my favorite Sargent. Painting. Yeah, if you, amazing. Mara, if you haven't been to the Clark Art Institute, you should go. It's the largest private collection of impressionist and post-impressionist art in the country. Oh, I need to go there. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, one of the things I love about art is everyone can do it. And it's something that we can pretty much do as we get older. And, you know, it's, just, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's a great outlet for feeling and emotion. And some people, you know, love it. They get, you know, some people get very frustrated. I get very frustrated. I mean, she, she was almost tossed a couple of times before I finished her. But um, yeah, I'd say every single painting I do goes through a hate stage. I think it's the same with writing, actually. So I think it's like my son. You know, I start off, he's a baby, you know, yeah. I'm cuddling him. <laughs> We're having a Are you saying time. your son went through a hate stage? <laughs> and then he's a teenager. Exactly. <laughs> like, oh my God, he's a teenager. What am I going right. to do with this? <laughs> and, then, and then eventually come back and he becomes an adult. He's not there yet, but eventually right. he's an adult. And they come back to us. 
<laughs> you get the finished product. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Well, I learned a whole lot today, Michelle, and like I learned so much more about you. Like this is so amazing to see you in your element as an artist and learn about what you do. So thank Hopefully you. Hopefully it didn't scare you. You'll come no, back to the it office, really, right? <laughs> it really inspired me. It really inspired me. I like I don't, as soon as I have some time, I'd really love to start learning a little bit about drawing because it, I know that it's really, um, it is meditative and it is really sort of a healing thing. So, um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing your talent with us today. Michelle, oh, thank welcome. you. I thought of going on YouTube to learn how to draw. That's an excellent idea. Thank you. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, there's so many, um, demos, you know, watercolor, oils, um, you know, you name it. Every artist has got something. I don't, but a lot of artists have um, demos on watercolors and it are not watercolors, but just doing art in general. It's a great service. It's free and you can do it in your own home and you can be, learn how to become an expert artist in private. <laughs> I know some people are you know, they don't like to do that in public or they feel uncomfortable going to a class because maybe they're like, well, I, I don't really know how to draw. Yeah, and, I don't yeah. want to be laughed at. <laughs> exactly. Like I laughed at my friend who couldn't draw balloons in the class <laughs> group. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And hopefully we can do this again sometime and learn some more about art because I actually would love to see more of your work and, and hear more about the process and maybe get a little deeper into the, to certain um, certain mediums and, uh, and learn more from you. So hopefully we can do that in the future. All right, well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.